Chapter 1 Human Destiny After Death, What? Author of The Gospel and Its Ministry, Redemption Truths, The Silence of God. N.C. 8th Edition The Question Stated According to the most careful estimate, the population of the world exceeds 1,400 millions. Not one-third of these are Christian even in name, and of this small minority how few there are whose lives give proof that they are traveling heavenward. And what is the destiny of all the rest? Any estimate of their number must be inaccurate and fanciful, and accuracy, if attainable, would be practically useless. As a matter of arithmetic, it is as easy to deal with millions as with tens, but when we come to realize that every unit is a human being, with a little world of joys and sorrows all his own, and an unbounded capacity for happiness or misery, the mind is utterly paralyzed by the effort to realize the problem. And these 1400 millions are but a single wave of the great tide of human life that breaks, generation after generation, upon the shore of the unknown world. What future then awaits these untold myriads of millions of mankind? Most of us have been trained in the belief that their portion is an existence of endless, hopeless torment. But few there are, surely, who have carried this belief to middle age unchallenged. Sometimes it is the vastness of the numbers whose fate is involved that startles us into skepticism. Sometimes it is the memory of friends now gone, who lived and died impenitent. As we think of an eternity in which they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever, the mind grows weary and the heart grows sick, and we turn to ask ourselves, is not God infinite in love? Is not the great atonement infinite in value? Is it credible then that such a future is to be the sequel to a brief and sorely tempted life of sin? Is it credible that for all eternity, that eternity in which the triumph of the cross shall be complete, and God shall be all in all, there shall still remain an underworld of seething sin and misery and horror? We can have no companionship with those who refuse to bring these questions to the test of Scripture. If such a hell be there revealed, faith must assert its supremacy, and all our difficulties, whether intellectual or moral, must be put aside unsolved. But what is, in fact, the voice of Scripture on the subject? The voice of the Church, it is true, has been heard in every age in support of the doctrine of an endless hell, and in some sense the testimony gains in weight from the fact that a minority never has been wanting to protest against the dogma, thus keeping it unceasingly upon the open field of free discussion. This affords sufficient proof, no doubt, that Scripture seems to teach the doctrine here in question. But more than this must by no means be conceded. On such a subject no appeal to authority will avail to silence doubt. The minority may, after all, be right. What men call heresy proves sometimes to be the truth of God. But how is such an inquiry to be entered on? It needs some scholarship and not a little patient study, and yet it is of interest to thousands who have neither learning nor leisure. Common folk whose opportunities and talents are but few must take advantage of the labors of others more favored than themselves. And we turn to their writings with the honest wish to find there an escape from the teaching of our childhood. Some, indeed, have used language which betokens pleasure at the thought of endless torment, but apart from the enthusiasm or the bitterness of controversy this would be impossible. Surely there is no one unwilling to be convinced that hell itself shall share at last in the reconciliation God has wrought, or, if the lost of earth are lost forever, that in the infinite mercy of God their misery shall end with a last great death that shall put a term to their existence. But here are two alternatives which are wholly inconsistent, two paths which diverge at the very threshold of the inquiry. Of which shall we make choice? If our instincts and prejudices are in the least to guide us, none will hesitate. We refuse to contemplate the annihilation of the lost save as an escape from something still more grievous. But what if Scripture warrants the belief that all the lost shall yet be saved, the banished ones brought home, and God's great prison closed forever as the crowning triumph of redemption? This is indeed a hope that with eagerness we would struggle to accept. 